Was it a hard one to do the first set for you? No, I had a great time. It was, it was actually easy. It was going or? Uh, it was going very well. Mm -hmm. The songs that you choose and? Uh... We actually changed quite a few things today. We had a mm -hmm. decent rehearsal and were able to ref refine the product. Mm -hmm. What was the story at the beginning? What, what, what did you change? Well, we changed musical things. And everything in this music is details. That makes the difference between good and very good. Mm -hmm. And uh, I try to pay attention to details, as we all do. And sometimes it could be only one note or a few words. And uh, then you try and see if it works. And actually, several of those songs had some little change today. Mm -hmm. But practically, this is the, the some other story than this is a show number six or seven. Yeah, it's You're the first time together. Yeah. Before you went on the flight, Mm -hmm. Beginning of the tour, you had a couple of phone calls and you said, okay, Steve, we're gonna do this, we're yeah. gonna do this. What are you up to? My song, standards, mixture of everything. So tell me how, how about Actually, this process. very much the process as you described it. It's, uh, oh God, it was even a while ago. I think we might add a few words. I don't even know if we actually talked about it. Mm -hmm. Maybe Adam and I did on the telephone. I don't think I talked to Steve about it at all. But we figured it would be a few originals and I know I would bring in one or two or standards, and Adam had something like all blues, as you heard, his arrangement. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but in this kind of music, the process takes place when you start to play. And things get uh, filtered and refined and changed and hopefully improved. And that can only happen after several nights of playing, usually. And I think we're at that point now in this particular 10 concerts we'll be giving. Uh, you spend a part of the day in front of piano on the, on the other side I did of today, the yes. studio composing yeah. or adding things? Because okay. or... I, I need to have the piano to check that I'm, my instincts are right. <laughs> That's the, um, it's kind of the test is the piano. That's what uh, you can hear the orchestra or the, how many pieces you have. Uh, and, and based on the discussion you have, a few of your songs, few of... Well, of course, Steve Swallow is one of the great composers of jazz. I mean, he's you know, classic. So to play his compositions is something, well, we all, as jazz musicians, we know his tunes. We've played some of them. Mm -hmm. And I have never played them in such concentrated manner as I have in the last week. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I've learned much more about them that I didn't know when I would just have a cursory uh, mm -hmm. approach to them. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they are great tunes, and they're a challenge to play. I mean, my tunes are always kind of a little, try to tell a story of sorts of different things and go through circles, usually. but. Steve's t songs are all little miniatures. They're like uh, Persian art or something. They're like little microscopic mm -hmm. um, jewels. Plus, you wanted to play it exact. Mm -hmm. Well, you try to be exact. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you want to be a good musician. Yeah. You play what's there, and then you bring your own uh, personality to bear on it, and even maybe some suggestions as to how it could be improved, at least for this particular setting. Uh, the first part of the interview, we were talking about uh, the period, uh, early days of uh, mm -hmm. Dave's view of uh, music. And all of a sudden, uh, end of 60s, beginning of the 70s, uh, Miles Davis. You know, it's always, you know, the, the thing is that we, we had so many musicians on this stage, you wouldn't believe that played with Miles. Yeah. Uh, some believable, <laughs> and it's always a part of the conversation is, you know, how can you avoid this? Definitely. Uh, uh, the first meeting with Miles, a classic question for this piece of mm, Well, I think it was a, a club called Danny's Hideaway or something on 46th Street. And this is when I was playing quite a bit and hanging with Steve Grossman, who eventually I played with with Elvin Jones for a few years. Mm -hmm. This is before that period. Steve was with Miles. And before he was with Miles. Yeah. And in fact, this is how he got with Miles. But we played a Sunday afternoon, myself and him, and Lenny White, George Cables, mm -hmm. Dave Holland, and a bass player named Lanny Fields, New York bass player, double quartet, and Bob Moses. And we played, and Miles came down because Lenny White knew him from Bitches Brew recording yeah. session. And he came, he sat there, and he took us outside and showed us where he had been shot at the night before in his. Uh, Dino Ferrari in Brooklyn. It's actually a well-known incident, but it was that day. Mm -hmm. so, come here, I'll show you my, show you the car. And it was bullet, bullet holes in the, the yellow one. The yellow one. Red car, man. A red one. This is before. Yeah, yeah, yeah before. And there were, yeah, well, there were I'm, too, I'm, too, I'm too young. For there were bullet holes in the door. Everything. He was like, hey, I got shot. At. 
I survived. <laughs> Me. But he came down and he sat with us, actually. That's the first time I met him. No, really. He played some. Oh, no, he didn't play. We were playing free, completely free jazz at that time. We played one tune for an hour and a half, and then one tune for another hour and a half. Yeah, but that was it. Yeah, we played one of my tunes and one of Steve's tunes. And, and we just played, uh, we were very much influenced in the late 60s, I was, and with Steve and Michael Brecker, a few other people, quite a few people actually, Bob Moses, by Ascension, Coltrane's Ascension, mm -hmm. was the most uh, uh, influential recording at that time for the group of musicians I was mm -hmm. with. And uh, we tried to emulate that as, as you do when you're young, you play what you love. Um, and that was meant that we'd have a lot of collective improvisations with many horns, many drummers, and so forth. And this was one of those occasions, and we did it in public. It's collective those. power. Yeah, collective, uh, what Coltrane did towards the end, at the end of his life, what he was playing, what he did in the last two years of his life, and with Pharaoh Saunders and Rashid Ali and Alice Coltrane, Alice Coltrane. and of course Jimmy Garrison, and, and then yeah. additional horn players or drummers as the occasion would warrant, mm -hmm. but uh, we were very influenced by that. Uh, to, to me, that was the top of the line of, you know, that was it. So we started there. In many ways, we had to go back to learn what came before. For example, Coltrane's incredible legacy with Miles and mm -hmm. his own, with Monk and his own playing. Mm -hmm. And of course, where it comes from, Charlie Parker and Lester Young and, uh, you know, to Art Tatum, etc. Mm -hmm. So for, my, for me and some of us, we didn't learn in school, so we had a learn ourselves, yeah, right. and that meant going back to what these people did when we finally were hearing the product of what they did, but we had to re return to the, to the roots you know, uh -huh. and learn it. Yeah, and Miles was, of course, very selective on choosing the names that who would fit to what kind of a source, and uh, yeah. you, you were one of the guys at, at that time. Well, he, he was, uh, one of his strongest abilities was his perceptive, um, he had a very good way of uh, realizing what a person could do musically mm -hmm. so he to enhance what he maximum wanted. Maximum out of him. Yeah. He knew that this one would play this way. He heard it. Mm -hmm. And he somehow made you do that without saying too much, <laughs> the force of his personality. Mm -hmm. So when he mixed his musicians together, usually, sometimes more successfully than others, but I think he was thinking of uh, balance and uh, tension and release, things that we discuss when we talk about any great art is uh, the opposites and the way you blend them. And I think he was aware of that in the musicians he chose. Yeah. And then, of course, my time with him was amazing, valuable learning experience because I was with a master. And also, I had never played uh, with a horn, another sax or, or a trumpet or saxophone player of that stature on a nightly basis. With the rhythm section, Chick Corea, Steve Swallow, Pete LaRocca, yeah, Elvin. Yeah. It's a different story. Yeah, yeah. But when you're with a horn player on the, in the front of the band, yeah. and you, you're you next it. to him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you can never learn that from the audience, and you never learn it from record. You yeah. can only be five feet away. <laughs> right, right. I right. tell you. So that was an experience, of course. Yeah. It was a really powerful band at that time. It was yeah. uh, Reginald Lucas, James M. Toomey, yeah. Michael Henderson from Temptations, and partly yeah. they were really, really strong. Yeah. yeah, it was very strong and very chaotic. And sometimes uh, I'm not sure it was musically as organized, at least as I would have liked it to have been. But it fits the time. It was perfectly it was definitely for, fit the for time. It 70s, early and 70s. And it, it fit yeah. what Miles wanted to do at that time. He had, as you know, we all know he had so many periods. And this is one particular period of his life, and he was living it out musically as well as personally. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Going out of Miles' family, how did this affect you? It was just a period you knew, I'm going to be here. Well, it makes you... If you want it, okay. You, you have to go on to your own. You cannot go backwards after Miles Davis. I mean, that was the word, and that was true. I mean, you were responsible to have a body of music and have a band. This was almost written, although it wasn't written. Mm -hmm. So that anybody who went through Miles knew the next step was to do their own music. Because so you, you couldn't go facing, backwards. You're facing the fact yeah, that... because he was the top of the yeah, mountain, yeah. you know, and uh, as far as a sideman goes. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, even if it was only for a brief period, it was a year and a half for me, but um, it meant that I, was, I had to come up with a body of music, which I was working on anyway, because he inspires you to do that. Mm -hmm. You see his direction and you say, I must be like that about music. And that was what I saw. Right. Mm -hmm. So your, your next step was uh, Richie Byrick. Right. We had relationship before. Farm and this, yeah. you know, so it was a big help or, or whatever oh, yeah. to go through. It was a yeah, to how to lead a band. I mean, it's <laughs> not easy to lead a band. Yeah. There are many elements. There are musical elements, 
psychological and of course business. Uh, it's very multifaceted. Yeah, to put it yeah, all I'm, together. Uh, and it's only get you only learn it from experience and watching and then making mistakes. Yeah, of right, course. Right. And this, this was but after him you were it was understood you must do that. There was nowhere else to go. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And after after so many years you ended up a part of Dave Liebman. We're talking about Dave Liebman as a teacher, as an educator, mm -hmm. and uh, you know it's it's a hard job. But I would believe, you know, especially in last couple of years or, 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 or after year 2000, you know, to motivate a kid, you know, listen, blow your horn or start doing something. Um, yes, but there are more people interested than ever before, amazingly enough, and uh, the, the people that come to musicians like us to, for learning are already serious about it for the most part. Now, they may not end up being professionals and performing. So you have, you have the feeling that when they show up, no, they mean it. They, they, yeah. they're dedicated. Yeah, and they come to you for what you have to tell them, not for something that they could get anywhere else. They could only get that from you. Mm -hmm. And therefore, anybody coming in there is pretty well motivated. I mean, I'm lucky. I respect so much teachers in music, of course, but in, I don't care if it's mathematics or grammar, who teach little kids who are just there and they don't know why they're there necessarily and to keep motivated every day is really a challenge i my students are motivated so i'm already starting from pretty much halfway you know? uh, how the american government and the, <laughs> how how they support this you know if yeah. we, we compare this with 70s 80s 90s now we're 2004 how, how that goes you know? uh, there is a little bit of support but it's very very small and it has if you gone, compare it with I cannot compare it with uh, 70s or 80s. Or no, you, or... Europe is way ahead, has always been. That's why so many musicians perform here. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have other, other situations with culture, and it's just the way it is. We're basically on our own in America. We do not get any help. And uh, we have to do everything ourselves, uh, make a living, book the jobs, and really take care of our publicity and so forth. <laughs> if you're very successful, you hire somebody, of course. But it's still your job to do it. You're not going to get any help from the government. At all. And the audience support is you have younger audience, you have mixed or, or you know, uh, Japanese in the uh, Seventh Avenue. Well, New York, <laughs> you get tourists in New York City. <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, I get musicians. People come to me are musicians. That's who's interested. I mean, the other people aren't interested. No, I'm talking about the audience. They, they go to see the shows and to, it's, to cover it's, the clubs. And, and yeah, the mostly now. musicians and young people who can afford it, because, of course, in New York, it's quite expensive, as you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, you go to universities, there's always a few people who enjoy it. And there's a very select audience. Uh, and they're young. They are young and old. But the, in America, we do get a fairly young audience in most, most cases. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's really, actually, it's very gratifying. I like, that's what I like about it. Mm -hmm. In, in, in general, how do you feel this general brainwash from pop music or whatever kind of shit that goes around from TV and this is still regular America? Well, we only talk to a it's few. getting worse? Or we talk to a few people. <laughs> okay. We only talk to a few okay. people. We go to one, one part of the room and we ignore the other part. Okay. Dave, thank you for My coming. Pleasure. Let's see thank the second you. set. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. We begin our second part with a composition by Adam Nussbaum. This is the name of our group, entitled We Three.
Stade Nostrand, we three. This is a song I wrote for a friend of all of ours, wonderful saxophonist named Arnie Lawrence, who is in Israel these days, for the last few years, working between the Palestinians and the Israelis with jazz, doing the best he can do. So I call him the Jewish warrior.
right there. Slow video. I was very glad to find this little flute, I don't know what you call it here, on the street near the hotel. That sounds very nice. Down by the riverside. On the riverside, yeah. Uh, this is a classic by Steve Swallow entitled, Hello, Bellinas.
to Steve Swallow. Hello, Molinas.
It's the Sea Swallow composition, and we conclude with Adam Nussbaum's BTU.
Mr. Adam Nussbaum. <laughs> to Steve Swallow. <laughs> Yours truly, David Liebman. <laughs> we three. And to the beautiful audience, we appreciate you. We're going to conclude with a great classic by Thelonious Monk entitled Played Twice.
We three, Adam Nussbaum, Steve Swallow, David Liebman, thank you so much.